Hello and welcome to chapter 12 in alternate care. We're going to be talking about home health care. We're going to start in the text on page 447. Um, in our intro to settings, um, if you look at the yellow box at the top, <clears throat> home health care is a service to the recovering, disabled, or chronically ill person providing for treatment and or effective functioning in the home environment. And our synonyms and examples are home care, visiting nurses, and visiting staff. So home health care encompasses a wide range of health and social services delivered in the home to recovering, disabled, and chronically or terminally ill persons in the need of medical, nursing, social, or therapeutic treatment and or assistance with activities of daily living. Throughout this chapter and in the real world, the term home health care is synonymous with home care, visiting nurses, and visiting staff. Home care may be considered as an alternative to some inpatient and outpatient procedures and treatments that are performed routinely in the traditional hospital or clinic setting. Home care has been around for years, but in earlier days, the concept of caring for patients at home was not considered as an industry. Over the years, the home care industry has grown substantially. The reasons for this growth can be attributed to cost savings, changes in reimbursement, technology, and advances in patients' right to choose. With implementation of the inpatient prospective payment system, government regulations have mod motivated hospitals to contain their cost, compelling them to consider utilizing other methods to deliver care to their patients. Home care is among the solutions to aid in minimizing hospital expenses while maintaining continuity of care and preventing expensive patient rehospitalizations. All right, so let's talk about the types of patients. So home visitation services are provided to individuals who are identified by a physician as having a medical necessity for skilled services. Some payer sources, such as Medicare and many private insurance companies, require that the patient be homebound. This means that the patient is confined to the home except for infrequent or relatively brief absences that require considerable and taxing effort. Patient referrals can be received from a variety of services, such as a hospital discharge planner, patients, patients' physicians, insurance companies through their case management programs, preferred provider organizations, and health maintenance organizations. After the agency receives the referral, it's required to have physician orders to provide services. Upon referral to the home health agency, a staff person from the home care agency will visit the patient's home to identify needs and to perform a comprehensive assessment. The agency staff works with the patient's physician to begin the patient's plan of care for home care visits based upon the results of this assessment. The preliminary work includes identifying the types of services the patient requires, which disciplines are required, such as physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, a home health aide or a social worker, as well as the supplies or medical equipment the patient may need. Further, it is determined how often these disciplines should visit the patient and what special orders are required to ensure continuity of care for the patient. All right, so let's get into the different types of caregivers. Many services can be offered to patients in a home care setting. An organization can be selective in determining what services it offers to patients. However, an agency has a competitive advantage in the home care market if it offers a variety of services. Skilled nursing agencies employ health care personnel with a variety of skill levels. Individuals employed by these agencies may include nurses trained in medical surgical nursing, intravenous therapy, interostomal therapy, psychiatric or mental health, maternity, or restorative nursing. The level of nursing care used depends on the individual patient need. In the event that a Medicare certified agency provides psychiatric nursing care, the agency must certify that the psychiatric nurse has met additional qualifying criteria to perform this function. Skilled nursing services must be supervised by a registered nurse. Skilled nursing agencies also employ a home health aide. This is a certified staff person who is able to enhance patient care by assisting with activities of daily living, such as checking vital signs, bathing, grooming, and preparing meals. Aides also may provide limited services, such as routine wound care and prescribed exercise monitoring, depending upon limitations as described by state regulations related to the home health aides practice. <clears throat> then we have different specialty services. 
So we have these different disciplines, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, medical social services, nutrition, respiratory, patient transportation, respite care, homemaking services, medical equipment, meals on wheels, and so on. So we're going to touch briefly on each one of these. Physical therapists establish a home exercise and maintenance program for the patient, assisting with exercise routines and ambulating devices. Occupational therapists assist the patient to become independent in performing tasks such as dressing, bathing, and other normal activities of daily living. Speech-language pathologists assist patients who suffer from a stroke or adverse effects of feeding tubes or endotracheal tubes. Speech-language pathologists teach proper swallowing techniques, word formation, and word enunciation. Medical social services help patients and family members cope with the patient's disease process through placement and involvement with community services. They also help to find appropriate resources and make suggestions for long-range planning. Nutrition or dietitians, they typically are not covered by Medicare, but patients always have the option to pay privately for special assistance with dietary needs. And for special respiratory conditions, respiratory therapists teach techniques to increase efficiency in the lungs, such as pursed lip breathing, and safety precautions when using oxygen in the home. Patient transportation services pick up patients and transport them to their desired destination, such as a physician's office. And this service is available for those who are willing to pay the fee. In-home respite care is a fee-for-service option not paid by Medicare. Those who deliver respite care relieve the primary caregiver of his or her duties for an extended time. During this time, the home respite caregiver monitors the patient like the caregiver would. Home respite care simply allows the primary caregiver to have some free time. Then we have durable medical equipment, such as wheelchairs or hospital beds. These are leased or purchased to aid in the patient's healing within the home setting. The use of durable medical equipment in the home is covered under Medicare Part B. And lastly, Meals on Wheels is a charitable organization that provides food services for those who are unable to leave the home. However, Medicare does not cover meals delivered to the home. All right, so moving over to regulatory issues on page 451, and we're not going to cover this whole section um, just because some of it is just a, um, a refresher on what these organizations are and what they do. So be sure to read through this section, um, but I'm just going to cover just the, 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 the very top section on page 451. Home care agencies may be not-for-profit or they may be pri proprietarily owned. They can operate as a standalone company, often referred to as freestanding. They also can participate in a partnership or operate as an affiliate to another institution, often a hospital. In the latter case, the home care headquarters can be physically separate from its affiliate or it can be affiliate based. Home care agencies or home care organizations have to consider a few accrediting and certifying agencies. So first we have Medicare and Medicaid. Then you have your individual state licensing agencies, the Joint Commission, Community Health Accreditation Program, or CHAP, and then the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, the ACHC. The National Association for Home Care and Hospice, the NAHC, though, is, though it is not an accrediting or certifying body, also offers current information at its website on regulatory issues affecting home care providers. So again, continue to read through that section under regulatory issues. I'm not going to go over all of that again, um, but a lot of it is just how um, these issues or how these organizations affect home care. So just be sure to read through those sections. So we're going to move over to page 454 and pick up with documentation. We're going to talk about um, in this section the form called the 485, which is technically not um, used now. Um, but we're, we're going to kind of talk through this form. The primary reasons for documentation, whether electronic or hard copy, are to maintain an accurate record of all care and services provided to the patient, so as to provide and maintain high-quality patient care, to meet all regulatory requirements, and to support reimbursement. For Medicare certified agencies, the Medicare conditions of participation for home health agencies specify certain documentation requirements. 
If an agency is interested in becoming accredited by the Joint Commission, CHAP, or the ACHC, the agency would have to obtain the appropriate accreditation manuals that outline specific standards regarding content, timeframes, and authorized staff. The Home Health Certification and Plan of Care, also known as the 485, certifies the patient's needs for home health services. And we have an example in Figure 12-1. The 485 also outlines the patient's plan of care, which must be established by his or her attending physician. And this document includes pertinent diagnosis, types of services, frequency and duration of visits, medication and treatments, safety measures, durable medical equipment, nutritional requirements, functional limitations, allergies, mental status, prognosis, activities of daily living, goals, rehabilitation potential, and discharge plans. And then our note here says that CMS has dropped the requirement for use of this specific form, stating simply that these elements should be included in the patient's plan of care. To make sure that all of these elements are indeed in the patient's plan of care, Many agencies have opted to continue using the 484, I mean the 485, or a form modeled after it. So while Medicare no longer requires it, a lot of facilities do still use it. Documentation of physician certification of the need for the home care is a requirement for payment under Medicare. Effective January 1, 2011, as a condition of payment, the Affordable Care Act mandates that prior to certifying a patient's eligibility for the home health benefit, the certifying physician must document that he or she, or an allowed non-physician practitioner, has had a face-to-face -face encounter with a patient. The face-to-face -face encounter must occur within the 90 days prior to the start of home health care or within the 30 days after the start of care. Although the face-to-face -face encounter is still required, effective for episodes beginning on or after January 1, 2015, CMS eliminated the requirement for the physician narrative documentation of the encounter as part of the certification of patient eligibility. The 2015 rule requires that the documentation to support certification of the patient's homebound status must be contained in the certifying physician's medical records and or the acute or post-acute care facility's medical records. The HHA may provide information from the HHA record, which is our home health um, agency record, to certifying physician and or the acute post-acute provider for incorporation into the provider's records to complete the face-to-face -face encounter document. All right, so we're going to move over to page 456. Another requirement under the Affordable Care Act is the physician or other eligible professional has to be enrolled in the internet-based provider enrollment chain and ownership system, or PACOS, to order or refer home health care services. Um, therefore, the CMS ordering and referring report must be checked to make sure that the certifying physician or MPP is registered prior to establishing a Medicare beneficiary plan of care. The patient's physician must review, update, and recertify, if necessary, the plan of care at least every 60 days. The time frame is often referred to as the patient's certification period. Recertification can continue every 60 days as long as the patient meets Medicare coverage guidelines or agrees to pay privately for services under the patient until the patient is discharged from services. Another documentation or another document required for home care is the comprehensive assessment, which is completed on the first visit. This document should include the patient's present illness, history of the present illness, significant past history, review of all systems, physical assessment, medications, psychological, psycho, yeah, psychological, social, and economic factors, emergency plans, and skilled nursing performed for that day. Based on the initial assessment and the patient's needs, the skilled nurse develops a care plan that includes goals, objectives, and those responsible for completing the plan. In addition, CMS expects home health agencies to complete the patient's comprehensive assessment before assigning the home health diagnosis to the OASIS-C1 instrument. An authorized staff person, determined by state law, takes verbal orders from the ordering physician. This, per this staff person must document, date, and sign the order. 
The order also must be signed by the physician and returned to the home care agency within a certain time frame determined by state law. Medicare certified agencies may not bill for services until all orders are signed and returned. That's a difficult process because, again, these patients are at home and you are given the order from a physician that you may not be seeing face to face. They could be in the clinic or they could be in the hospital. And getting that paper to them or getting that signed electronically um, can kind of be a little difficult. And actually getting it back, um, especially your paper copies, signed before you can do any of your billing. Skilled nursing services must be supervised by a registered nurse and documented at appropriate intervals determined by state law. Home health aid services require supervisory visits by the registered nurse and documentation at appropriate intervals, also determined by state law. In addition, physical therapy assistant services and certified occupational therapy assistant services require supervisory visits by the physical therapist or occupational therapist and should be documented at intervals required by regulation. Additional documents include the patient database, hospital discharge information, information collected upon referral, patient bill of rights, advanced directives, your DNR orders, medication profile, all initial baseline assessments and progress notes, problem list, care plans, teaching guides, and discharge summary. And then we get back into our um, different kinds of record formats. So we have our source-oriented, problem-oriented, and integrated. So just to touch back on that briefly, your source-oriented is going to be your traditional way in which a record is organized, and it's sorted into different sections according to the actual department or discipline. So you're going to have um, all of your therapy notes together. You're going to have all of your physician documentation together. You're going to have all your nursing documentation together. And then it's going to be arranged according to date. So the major advantage of this is that it organizes the reports from each source together so you can see the assessments and treatments and observations for that discipline all together. You're not having to search through um, dates to find this radiology result or this therapy note or this physician order. It's all contained in one section together. But the disadvantage is that it's not possible to quickly determine all of the patient's problems. And it's also difficult to determine all of the treatments being provided for the patient at a given time. So problem-oriented, it provides a systematic method of documentation to reflect logical thinking on the part of the person directing the patient's care. The individual directing the patient's care defines and follows each clinical problem individually and organizes the problems for solution. The record must contain four basic components, database, complete problem list, initial plans, and the progress notes. Advantages are that the individual directing the patient care is required to consider the patient's problems in total context. The record clearly indicates the goals and methods in treating the patient. Medical education is facilitated by documenting logical thought processes. But a disadvantage is that the format usually requires training of the professional staff. Also, for this chart format to be effective, the professional staff must be convinced of the system's worth because sometimes it can be a little difficult. Then we have our integrated format. And this is where it's just organized in strict chronological order. The forms from the various sources are all intermingled. An advantage of this is that information in is going to read like a book. It provides a clear picture of the patient's illness and response to treatment from start to finish. However, it's difficult to compare similar information over a period of time because not all of your lab values are together, not all of your therapy notes are together. So you've kind of got to go back um, two or three days, four days, a week, two weeks, and find the last lab, um, the last lab report or the last therapy note. So it's not together, but it is in chronological order and should read from start to finish. All right, let's move down to the OASIS C1. <clears throat> the outcome and assessment information set C1 is a group of data items designed to establish a means of systematic measurement of the patient's home health care outcomes. 
Outcomes for the purpose of the OASIS C1 measure changes in a patient's health status between two or more time points. OASIS C1 data items address socio-demographic, environmental, support system, health status, functional status, and health service utilization characteristics of the patient. The data are collected at specific time points, including start of care, every 60 days on a follow-up OASIS C1, post-hospitalization, and a transfer or discharge. All right, moving over to page 458. <clears throat> there are several methods in gathering and reporting the OASIS C1 information. Some home health agencies gather all of their information electronically in the field and then transmit the data. Others gather information on paper and manually enter the data into an electronic file called encoding. Others gather the data on paper and scan the information. Data also are submitted in a variety of ways. Some agencies have purchased software specifically for the OASIS C1 data and their transmission. Others have elected to use software available at no charge from CMS, and this software is called HAVEN, Home Assessment Validation and Entry. The Medicare Conditions of Participation detail the timeframes for completion and transmission of the OASIS C1 data. Generally, the data must be encoded and locked within seven days of completion of the assessment. During this seven-day time frame, the data must be analyzed for accuracy and edited if needed. Once the data elements have been locked, which prevents subsequent editing and ensures stability of the data, they can be batched in a submission file and transmitted to the state agency. All right, moving over to reimbursement on 459. So we have um, one, two, three, four different types of um, insurance listed here. And um, so we're going to just kind of briefly discuss each one of these. So first we have Medicare. So Medicare, a home care agency has paid a specific dollar amount for a 60-day period based on the patient's home health resource group or the HHRG. And then we have Medicaid. They're paid a base on a rate determined by the state legislature. And this, this rate can vary from state to state. Then we have our private insurances, and they are going to be um, paid based on a percentage of charges. And then we have self-pay. Patient opts to acknowledge that he or she understands that Medicare or Medicaid or other payers will not pay for the services and that he or she will pay for the services out of pocket. Dropping down to the Medicare Perspective Payment System. So on October 1st, 2000, the Home Health Perspective Payment System became effective and changed the way in which home care agencies were reimbursed for Medicare patients. The HHPPS system was implemented to promote some efficiencies and cost savings experience when Medicare payments to hospitals were converted to the Perspective Payment System. Under this payment system, home care agencies are paid based on the OASIS assessment, an episodic payment for 60 days of care, depending on the severity of the patient's illness and the services required. After the assessment of the patient has been performed and the OASIS C1 completed, the Home Health Resource Group, based on the answers to certain identified uh, OASIS C1 questions, can be determined. The HHRG is represented by a six-character alphanumeric code indicating severity, which enables the patient to have an assigned episodic rate of payment based on the patient's individual assessment. Now, dropping down, there are um, three areas that determine the HHRG. First, we have our clinical dimension. This establishes the scoring based on primary diagnosis and secondary diagnosis for the top six diagnoses on the plan of care. Vision, level of pain, pressure, presence of ul ulcers or wounds, dyspnea, urinary and bowel status, need for infusion, and behavior. And then we have our second, which is our functional dimension. This assesses the patient's ability to perform um, Activities of daily living are your ADLs, such as dressing, bathing, toileting, transferring, and ambulating safely within the home setting. And these areas carry more weight depending on the number of therapy visits the patient is projected to receive. Then we have service utilization. This is our third. 
This determines the level of service that the patient is likely to need based on the number of therapy visits received during the episode of care. Therapy visits are combined for OT, PT, and speech therapy to get the total number of visits projected from the start of the episode. The payment system is set up on a tiered methodology. Therapy reimbursement to the episode is broken down in the following groups. Therapy 0 to 5 visits, 6 to 9 visits, 10 to 13, 14 to 19, and 20 plus visits per episode. The initial assessment is a projection of the possible visits for the episode, and the reimbursement is then adjusted at the final claim for the actual number of therapy visits provided. Before submitting claims to Medicare, the HHRG must be converted to a Health Insurance Perspective Payment System Code, or HIPS. HIPS codes also are alphanumeric, but unlike the HHRG, they're made up of five characters, including a character to indicate the level of supply utilization. Payments for the 60-day episodes are made in two installments. The first, when a request for anticipated payment, a wrap, is submitted to Medicare, and the second, when the final claim is filed. Patients are covered for an unlimited number of episodes as long as they continue to meet the Medicare criteria for skilled care. And then you have some exceptions to the 60-day payment. So you have your low utilization payment adjustment. And so if the patient receives four or fewer visits in the 60-day episode, payment will be made by the visit. Then you have partial episode payments. Occasionally, a patient may transfer to another agency for care, in which case the first agency would receive payment for only a part of the episode for which it actually provided care to the patient. And when the patient starts receiving care from the new agency, a new episode begins. And then our outliers. An outlier occurs when the provision of care to a patient results in unusually high cost to the home care agency. Payment adjustments are made for a portion of the cost above the set threshold. All right. Moving down to payer mix. So your payer mix is a term describing the ratio of various types of third-party payers that provide revenue to a healthcare organization. Um, so this is where you would think of, this is going to be a pie chart. So we take all of the different payers for the patients insured, and we put that in a pie chart to show the percentage of each type of insurance. So our example here is, let's say 70% of our patients are insured by Medicare. So that's gonna be a big piece of our pie because our pie is only 100%. Then next, we've got 20% Medicaid, and 10% is gonna be other third-party payers. So if you take the 70 plus 20 plus 10, that's 100. And so you're talking about ratios, we're talking about pie charts, and we're talking about percentages of a whole. So that's what our payer mix is. Payer mix um, in this instance is 70% Medicare, 20% Medicaid, 10% other third party payers. Moving down to financial stability. Within the federal government, CMS and the Department of Health and Human Services administer the Medicare program. They manage the program through rules and regulations described within the Medicare Conditions of Participation. At the state level, the fiscal intermediaries, such as Palmetto, GBA, Cahaba, and so on, carry out these rules and regulations. Each agency must submit a yearly cost report to its fiscal intermediary or Medicare Administrative Contractor for review. This report includes such items as operating cost, number of visits, and payer mix. Upon review of this report, a rate is determined for the cost of reimbursement adjustment. A good business practice is to keep fixed costs as low as possible. Fixed costs do not change when the volume of services changes. In the service injury in industry, such as health, home health, examples of fixed costs are rent and utilities. Variable costs vary in proportion to the services provided. For example, when visits increase in number, the cost associated with visits, such as labor cost and transportation cost, also increase. Dropping down to the bottom, um, audits and denials. The financial side of an agency potentially will undergo an audit. Possible re reasons for a cost report that requires further investigation, a high volume of services, or a history of high denial rate. 
However, if claims are submitted properly as stated in the guidelines and are delineated further in medical, Medicare local and national coverage determination policies, and if documentation exists to support the reimbursement, an audit does not pose a serious risk to the agencies. A denial occurs when Medicare notifies the provider that the claim will not be paid, and therefore the amount billed to Medicare is no longer considered a, rec a receivable to the agency. The process begins when Medicare noticing an area in the delivery of care to a patient that does not follow guidelines, such as an excessive utilization of a specific service. Medicare then requests documentation. If documentation does not support the utilization, a denial is issued. An agency may appeal by sending written justification and any other data as outlined in Medicare instructions on responding to the denials, additional development requests, and so on. Medicare ultimately remits or denies payment. Most agencies have a low denial rate. All right, so we're going to stop this lecture here, and we are going to pick up um, on page 463 in our next lecture.